Our next speaker, we've got Walter Ram. You've heard from him already, but he's going to talk to us specifically about company experiences with food safety. He is the vice president of food safety at Gamera Companies. I hope I pronounce it Gamara Companies. Present Well, hello again. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off script and race through the slides that I had set up so that we can get more to question and answers. In the meantime, um, let's see who we're talking to. How many, how many growers are in the room? Raise your hand. And of the growers in the room, how many grow berries? And how many grow other items? And how many uh, packers? Processors? Okay, good. Good, good. Well, anyway, I work for a, um, a fairly large California-based produce company. And um, we're family-owned. We have product from um, over a dozen countries and states all over the U.S. We're growers, packers, processors. We have a winery. We have a juice plant. We import, we export. We are totally, fully integrated. We've got growers from all over the world, and we export all over the world. And why am I saying that? Because FISMA affects all of this. Now, for most of you, the... Um, Biggest effect is going to come from the produce rule, but the produce rule does not operate by itself. It will work in conjunction with all the other rules that FDA is going to be putting out for the Food Safety Modernization Act. Let me give you a little clarification about the act itself. Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act, and it was signed into law by President Obama in January of 2011. But what they did was they said, we're going to have food safety regulation. It's kind of like if the Department of Transportation said we're going to have speed limits, but they didn't, you know, Congress will not say which roads are going to be which speed limit. So they'll have the, the Departments of the Department of Transportation in the states figure which roads get which speed limits, and that's where, in this case, the FDA is writing the regulation, which they're releasing as rules. A rule is a body of regulation. Now, FISMA is going to be different for the produce industry that it's going to be for just about any other food group. And for starters, it's because fresh produce has been unregulated, uh, even in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the 1938 law you've heard mentioned earlier. Uh, fresh produce, which they term as raw agricultural commodities, had an exemption. Well, fresh produce is now regulated, and it's the largest uh, uh, before it was the largest unregulated segment in the food supply, and it was the only major one that didn't have a kill step. And unfortunately, um, it's one law or one body of regulation to fit all fresh produce, not just berries, not just berries from Washington. But one of the reasons that, that some of these things might seem a little overkill in some places is it's one size fits all. Quite frankly, I don't believe that there's a a single produce industry. I believe we're a group of industries, at least from a food safety standpoint. You could look at uh, uh, tree fruit, root vegetables, you know, a row crop, and go on and on. But the fact is, is that we have a body of regulation that's meant to fit all. And so we're going to have to make the best of it. Now, in reality, unlike most food products, our products grows, is grown, most of it's grown outdoors. Now, from a technical standpoint, that means it's grown in insanitary conditions. And so that's where we are different. Now, I'm gonna, I was going to originally talk more about the produce safety rule. I'm going to run through this relatively quickly and, uh, uh, so that we can get to some specifics. But um, I'm going to run through now couple of items about why we're different and why we're uh, somebody one of the presenters earlier mentioned that um, uh, that we're mostly interested in microbiological hazards now food safety programs for the fresh produce industry consider three 
hazard types, chemical, physical, and biological. Well, these are covered under FSMA, but in the preamble, in other words, in the, in the wording of, of, the, uh, of FSMA, they talk about that they're going to be principally addressing biological hazards. And it's pretty simple why. Because that's where the problems have been. And we've seen outbreaks like never before. Does that mean that we have a, a problem with our food that didn't exist before? No, just the opposite is true. What we have is science has developed detection methods that were just unavailable before. Just, they were science fiction. And, and now uh, uh, we can detect uh, uh, bacteria and illnesses in ways that, that uh, nobody had ever anticipated. And it's, a lot of that has to do with uh, CDC having their PulseNet program. PulseNet is a database that connects ba every major hospital, clinic. Uh, Charles can tell you all about it. Uh, 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 so that we can zero in on when outbreaks occur. Well, it's, uh, FDA is actually moving away from PulseNet and even going into a more sophisticated program. So the bottom line is, is that Big Brother is watching and there's not a heck of a lot we can do about it. Uh, like was mentioned before, they don't care how we feel. Their responsibility is to protect public health. The good news is there's an awful lot we can do about it. So I've mentioned before that the produce safety rule is um, going to be what, what affects most of us here. I put down it's mostly risk-based, and, and uh, uh, that will have to do with some facilities that are off of farms. But for the most part, FSMA is designed, or at least the produce rule is designed, with prevention in mind. You know, it's not just what you have to do that you didn't have to do before. It'll actually give you a layer of protection that uh, if you're not already doing it, that you should be. Uh, one question for the growers in the room. How many of you have GAP programs? How many of you have GAP programs that are audited by a third party? How many don't have GAP programs? Okay. Well, the good news is, is that if you, if you have a good, robust GAP program, you're most of the way there. So this isn't going to rock your boat totally. There are going to be some changes. I'm going to be skipping through a little bit here. Now, one, of the, one bit of good news is, I mean, everybody uh, who has a GAP program is uh, obviously is doing water testing. Now, the produce rule is really, really uh, uh, into agricultural water. And why? Because um, it's a major vector. I'll explain what that is. You know, just because there's bacteria present, you know, they don't have wings. You know, how do they get, uh, um, you know, how does it get onto the fresh produce? Charles showed some pictures of uh, three different organisms, and, and they were all flagellates. That means they have a little tail that they can use like a little motorboat, but not all of them do. So, so a vector is a transference mechanism. How? how bacteria gets from wherever it is onto your products. And while the list could be endless, if you get your arms around people, water, and animals, you've got the bulk of it licked. But water is one that's common to almost every operation, and, and it has been a source of problems in a lot of the outbreaks that have happened over the last 50 years. So FDA uh, uh, has paid particular attention to agricultural water. Now, in the past, water tests were done for E. coli, fecal coliforms, total coliforms, salmonella, all, all different kinds of organisms. FDA is using single generic E. coli. Now, generic E. coli, by the way, is not a pathogen. We all have it inside of our intestines. It helps with our digestion. Not all E. coli is a pathogen, a pathogen being um, any bacteria, any, any microbe that can cause disease. So this is the one organism that you'll be testing for. No, 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 no. I don't know if you could hear that, but I did. Anyway, so uh, um, the water testing that they're going to require is going to depend on the source. Testing is going to be required for all agricultural water. Now, by the way, agricultural water is water that either coming, has potential coming in contact uh, with the food itself, or the fruit in this case, or a food contact surface. That part actually makes a lot of sense. Now, there's some areas where there's zero tolerance. I mean, basically, you have to have drinking water standards, you know, for, uh, for your water, but those are mostly in a facility. So for items like hand washing, 
uh, cleaning food contact surfaces, uh, any water that would that you'd use to wash fruit. I know we don't wash blueberries and blackberries, but uh, you know a lot of commodities are washed, so that water has to be uh, um, uh, zero uh, zero tolerance for E. coli. And then, of course, making ice. I think ice is uh, overlooked in when it comes to public health. Now, this is going to be the scariest slide that I show you. This is this is uh, testing. Uh, uh, this is this is the uh, um, the standard for irrigation water, and I know it looks like Star Wars, but don't let this don't let these numbers worry you at this time. I'll get through there. Um, the 126 CFU uh, uh, count for generic E. coli is really the uh, EPA's recreational uh, uh, water standard. In other words. When the, when, when the state closes a beach or a lake or something like that because the water is too contaminated, this is the uh, um, standard that they're referring to. And uh, uh, the idea, the way that they got to this was, I'm going to oversimplify this, but the rationale is if somebody's swimming in, let's say, in a contaminated lake, that they're going to get so much water in their mouth or whatever. This is a, this is a level that they put it on uh, uh, to... Um, make sure that, that, uh, uh, that the levels have to be below this number. Now, um, the next number down is actually a, a rolling value. This one, rather than being a set value, the statistical threshold value, is we know what happens when it rains, when rivers are high. Things happen outdoors. Things happen indoors, too. And, and uh, this is to take, this is, this is because they know that good water sources at times will have spikes in E. coli counts, and this is actually meant to uh, 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 account for that. Now, this looks like something that's uh, uh, going to be pretty difficult to deal with, but actually, if you get back your water test, FDA is uh, working on putting together an online tool so that you can plug in your, your water test results, and it, it, this would be relatively straightforward to calculate. And I'm going to skip forward a little bit here. Uh, the, the compliance dates for, for water are, are still a ways off, so they're going to have time both to, to have outreach with you and so that uh, you know uh, uh, what's available from your local and online uh, resources so that uh, you can comply with this. It's not, not going to be as hard as it looks. Well, not if they get the tool right, at least. Um, so what happens if you have water that won't meet this criteria? Well, there's a few options, a couple of them that are already listed. One is uh, 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 allowing time for die-off between uh, um, uh, the time that, that, that the water was applied and, and when, when the product was harvested. There's another one that uh, this is not, not really applicable to berries, and it's uh, for items that are long-term storage that uh, they'll, they'll allow for die-off in storage, or you can treat the water. You know, real... Now... Is anyone concerned about this yet? I only saw one hand, two hands going up, three hands, so nobody else is concerned. Well, here's the good news. I mean, um, this is only for water that actually contacts the fruit. So how many people here use overhead irrigation? It'll definitely, it will definitely apply to you. How many people use uh, furrow irrigation? Furrow irrigation? Drip irrigation? Aha, drip irrigation, then you don't have to worry about this. It means that by law, you don't have to do the test. Now, to, for your GAP programs, you do. Quite frankly, you wouldn't be, it, it, would not, it would be unwise not to test your water at least annually. You should know what goes on there. And Drip irrigation, so that has a potential. So they do have to test for that, I think. Okay. No, the, and... and, and, uh, and now, one of the rationales of the way that these rules are written, we'll, we'll get to the questions in, in after a bit. One, one of the, one of the uh, uh, rationales was to drive the industry to better practices. So that could mean that, okay, you have a choice then. You can test the water or you can lower your drip system. And that's completely up to you. But the, the, that's you know, long term, we'll, and, and we'll, come, we'll come back to this uh, during the question and answer period. Now, surface water, for good reason, is considered to be the most vulnerable. And so, uh, uh, Barb mentioned uh, uh, earlier about 20 samples. In two to four years, you have to take 20 samples to calculate both your, uh, your, uh, uh, both values for, 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 the, uh, for the water, for your water quality. 
after that, it, it starts getting a, um, a lot simpler. The idea being in that you should, after your initial test, if your water's okay, you need fewer and fewer tests. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of this because this will be easier as time goes on. Um, now, groundwater, read, read this as well water, untreated groundwater, consider that as well water. Again, this is four samples rather than 20. And so uh, uh, there, obviously, FDA considers that there's much less risk with well water than there's a surface water. And st uh, the history is actually evidence uh, uh, points to that, that uh, they're absolutely right about that. Uh, as long as you don't ha you're not having any, any uh, uh, E. coli problems, any, uh, then, then, um, then once, sampling once a year is going to be all that's required. I'm going to skip by a little of this because we're going to, I'd rather have a question and answer period. By the way, if, if I'm skipping over anything that anyone wants me to go back to, just uh, uh, make a note of it and we'll come right back to it. Now, public water systems. Now, this is generally meaning municipal water and it almost, you know, it makes sense that this is really for facilities. If you have a, uh, um, if you're using municipal water or a public water system, um, it has to meet EPA drinking water standards. And so, you're not required to test this water under law. Now, your GMP programs, your auditing programs will still require you to do it because they're gonna want you to uh, test not just the water, but your plumbing systems to make sure you don't have any leaks or other, other uh, sources of problems in your facility. But the law says that you don't have to do it, but you do have to keep on file a copy of the water quality report or the water test uh, from, your, from your local water company. And, and those are generally available online. Any questions on water right now uh, uh, that are that are specific to this? And and uh, 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 or or, do you, or now on second thought, we're going to come back to this at the very end because I want to get through the rest of this. Biological soil amendments are the next thing that, that is mentioned, and mostly they're talking about manure and compost. Not not totally, but mostly. Now, unlike uh, most customers, FDA does not prohibit farmers from using raw manure. They, in the, in the um, preliminary version of the, um, of the produce rule, they did. They didn't like, they, they wanted to uh, uh, exclude raw manure the same way that every major retail and food service company does. But um, they, un, under a lot of pressure from uh, organic associations, uh, they, um, uh, they actually wrote in uh, the language saying that, uh, that, they, that they do not prohibit uh, uh, manure use. They, uh, following the USDA's uh, National Organic Program, though, they, uh, uh, they put down the 120-day the interval between application and harvest, and a 90-day interval is required between an application of, uh, and harvest for uh, crops that are, are, I should say, that aren't in contact with the soil. I left out a very important part above, and that's for, think of it like strawberries, the 120-day, and blueberries, the 90-day portion. Now, Understand though that uh, raw manure is very septic. You know, it's got a, it's got a lot of uh, um, a lot of nutrient qualities, but it's also got a large bac uh, a bacterial signature. So it's much it's much wiser to use uh, um, uh, composted manure. So the uh, uh, the produce rule listed as stabilized compost. That's the legal or technical way of putting down its uh, uh, compost has been properly composted. There are now, um, a, there is a standard for microbial count in compost uh, under the rule. And the rule also uh, um, uh, lists a couple of uh, uh, validated uh, uh, composting procedures. That's more for, for people that are, that are uh, commercial composters, but also if you're doing any amount of composting yourself, you have to meet these standards. Um, move on to animals. I'm going pretty quickly. Am I, uh, should I slow down? Everyone okay? I'm not hearing anything, so I'll keep going pretty quickly. Okay. We're, 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 order, we're ordered to... Uh, uh, to uh, test our wells, uh, not only for the irrigation, but a lot of that same irrigation water is used for washing your picking machine. So they want to make sure that, that the quality of that water is good of cleaning your equipment, like your, your picking machine. Well, absolutely, because think of it this way. Whatever's in that water 
you're going to be painting your harvesting equipment with. You know, so, so if uh, um, uh, you can use a sanitizer on, on your equipment, but if you rinse it off with contaminated water, you're going to have contaminated equipment. You know, and I don't want to miss this later, but when it comes time for uh, spray applications, when you do make your spray dilutions, don't dilute your sprays with any water that you wouldn't drink. Otherwise, you're going to inoculate your entire crop. Uh, one, one of the early and worst uh, uh, cyclospora outbreaks uh, from berries happened from Guatemala in 1995, and that's exactly what happened. They used canal water for their spray dilutions, and this canal, unfortunately, was loaded with this uh, protozoan parasite called cyclospora, and they got, I forget how many people sick, but it was, it was a, a, a lot. And they were doing everything else right. And the same thing, uh, we've seen that on other crops with other organisms. And so be very, very careful on, on, on where you source your dilution water for your spray applications. Anyway, back to animals. Curiously enough, FDA does not make a distinction between domesticated and wild animals. It doesn't matter whether it's livestock, uh, wildlife, your pet Airedale, an animal's an animal uh, under, under the regulation. And, uh, um, but fortunately, FDA does not order you to exclude all animals from your farms. One of the biggest reasons for that is it's impossible. I mean, how do you keep the birds out? How do you keep the deer out? I mean, it's, especially for berry growers, it's in your best interest to keep animals out just for production reasons, but it's also a very good idea to, uh, to keep them out for, um, for food safety reasons, especially ruminants. Ruminants, uh, their droppings are, uh, tend to be a lot worse than, uh, than other animals. But so what, ha what, what, what you do have to do at a minimum is you have to keep an eye on things and visually examine it. We have a, a blackberry operation in, in one of the southern states that um, we got a call one, um, uh, one day about, they had a lot of feral pigs show up and it turned out it was in, 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 a, in an area that was about four acres out of a 40 acre farm. And so uh, there's no way that those berries could be harvested. There was trouble. There were pigs that were roosting at night. And so what we did was, because this could get expensive too, and, but, but it, was, it, was, uh, it was a nightmare waiting to happen had those berries been harvested. So what we did was we examined the entire operation, identified the areas that had the problem, and created an exclusion zone. That's a fancy way of saying we taped off the part that had the pig poop in it, and we didn't harvest those berries. But we were able to harvest the, uh, uh, the rest of the farm uh, that, that didn't include the, um, uh, the contaminated part in a small buffer zone. And everything worked out fine. Now, had they actually harvested those berries, uh, who knows what would have happened. It, don't even want to think about that. Moving on to um, worker training and health. Anybody who's got a, um, a GAP program or a GMP program, a food safety program of any sort, already, is already familiar with having to, uh, to train workers. And um, now it's required. And as anything that's required from the government, so is uh, the paperwork that goes along with it. But you're already doing that for your, uh, uh, for your audit certifications, uh, uh, all except one of you in here, I believe, uh, that has these programs, uh, has third-party audits. So you're already familiar with, um, with the process. One thing that's different in this one is that aside from having uh, uh, training in, in uh, uh, food safety principles and, um, and uh, personal hygiene, is that now we have to train our people. Uh, people have to be trained on, on the tasks that they're responsible for. And this includes items that aren't food safety. In other words, they want a forklift operator to pretty much know how to drive a forklift. And, and uh, the same thing that would happen with, uh, um, uh, you know, if you have somebody that's responsible for cleaning and sanitizing, they should have the proper, the proper training to know how to do their job. So why would a food safety rule have a, a regulation like this in there? Because we don't live in a vacuum. Somebody's on a forklift and, and, the for, and, and uh, 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 if the forklift is filthy, if the guy's rubbing up against, you know, in other words, 
a lot of activities can affect other activities. We don't live in a vacuum. But anyway, this is, uh, this is something that we have to, uh, um, uh, to document now that's a little bit different from your uh, uh, GAP and GMP audits. Also, uh, the people doing the training have to be properly educated. That doesn't mean that they need to have a PhD in food science, but it does mean that, uh, that they should know what they're talking about. FDA is, uh, has to put something down like this in the regulation, but their fairly broad on-the-job training is, uh, is enough if, if, if uh, the uh, trainer can, can display competence. So if he knows what he's talking about, you know, he doesn't have to have a degree in food science for this, but you want to make sure that, uh, that you have somebody that's uh, uh, really knowledgeable in doing your training. And, the, the, and it doesn't say that the, that the trainer has to be a company employee. It could be a friend, an extension agent, an association member, you know, but just as long as it's somebody that knows what they're talking about. Next, we get to equipments, tools, and storage. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Um, tools, packing lines, they should be clean. They should be uh, uh, sanitized. Basically, they should not be avenues for contamination or cross-contamination. Because otherwise, that's how you turn one infected piece of fruit into infecting everything else around it. So it's a matter, it's a matter of keeping your eye on the ball. And, and uh, that's why this, uh, this rule is in there for, um, uh, to keep a small problem from turning into a big problem. Now, this includes restroom and toilet facilities. So when do we have to do this? Um, actually, one group that I left out of here was uh, farms that are smaller, that uh, have less than $25,000 worth of sales on average over the previous uh, three years. I don't think anybody voluntarily wants to have that, so I didn't even include it. But uh, the smallest farms have four years. Farms that, that uh, sell uh, or Companies that sell uh, uh, 250 to 500,000 annually have three years to comply, and everybody else has has uh, has to be ready within two years. Now, there's some exceptions to this in water quality, plus it's uh, the the testing and record keeping. There's an extension generally of two years, but that'll depend on, e on each individual uh, operation. So we have quite a bit of time to get to get the water quality uh, um, requirements uh, in order. Now. From a practical standpoint, regardless of what the law says, keeping your water quality in order is always a good idea anyway. Now this slide comes right from an FDA one. It says pretty much the same thing as I had on there before, but this is a lot more official. Now we'll talk about a little bit about enforcement. In the past, in the past, uh, um, FDA couldn't go onto your establishment unless there was a problem going on. Well, with, with, uh, with FISMA, they now have that authority. What they don't have is a lot of people to do it. Uh, there's less than 15,000 people, I believe the current number is 14,800 and change, employees at FDA. That sounds like an awful lot, but they not only regulate 80% of the U.S. food supply, they're also responsible for pharmaceuticals, medical devices. I can go on and on and on, and I don't know how many investigators they have, but it's not very many. Charles, about how many do they have? about a thousand and we're a country of 315 million I don't think that's quite enough so on the USDA that they had has over 105,000 but USDA is not the the regulatory agency that uh, is responsible for the produce industry so as a result the FDA is going to be using the states they're going to weigh heavily with the states for, for enforcement. That doesn't mean that they, that, uh, that they won't be around themselves, but that does mean that you might be seeing more and more of, uh, of your state people uh, uh, with, you know, looking, looking uh, uh, to perform tasks that are FISMA related. Now, um, another thing. I haven't seen this written down anywhere, but in conversations with people in, in, at, at FDA, and, and I do work with them uh, rather regularly, you know, I don't think that they're going to be looking to, uh, it's not going to be a traffic cop with a radar gun at the end of your street right from the get-go. They're going to be looking, to, as, especially during this phase-in period, 
to get people on board. So, so uh, uh, the whole idea is, is, is that it, it, as long as you're making a concerted effort, that, that uh, I, don't, I don't see where this is going to rock the world of, uh, for Washington State agriculture. There's some places in the country that will affect more. But, and, here's, and, and here's one thing that, you, that uh, should be mentioned too. This also affects agriculture in other countries if that product is to be sold here in the U.S., so when you ask why some of the uh, items like frozen berries is an example, because this also includes frozen berries that could be coming from any other country. And this body of regulation is written and the legislation is written to protect public health. And so uh, all the, while some of it may seem excess on, on, the, uh, um, uh, on the surface, there, there's a lot of reasons to go in deep because again, this is, covers all commodities from all areas. I'm going to sit down a little. I, uh, uh, I've got a, I injured my back recently. Listeria. Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhu gave a pretty good talk, uh, a lot of good information on listeria, but it's an organism that really, up until recently, hasn't been on the radar in the fresh produce industry. Yeah, I was, I was more worried about the, the, um, the, uh, screen being in front of me in the <laughs> and and anyway so uh, now I can't see it <laughs> I think what I'm going to do is move it over this way oh, yeah. well I'm still going to block out somebody but anyway um, in in um, 2011 um, this is pretty so okay in 2011 um, there was a uh, a listeria outbreak that uh, was mentioned earlier that it was, it was uh, I think it was the worst one we've had in the U.S. history. 33 people uh, died and then one miscarriage resulted from it and it was from cantaloupe. And um, the, it was from Jensen Farms in, in Colorado. And, and the Jensen brothers, um, they actually had a food safety certification, but they weren't, you know, Understand that standards are a minimum, and they were doing the minimum, and a perfect storm happened in, at their operation. And um, they weren't sanitizing their floors. I bet most people don't. I know people with listeria programs do, but this is a, a anyway, uh, it ended up being a, a real American tragedy. And so, uh, even if that was the only one, which it hasn't been for fresh produce, uh, you know, uh, Listeria is here to stay, as far as Listeria control, I should say, is here to stay in the fresh produce industry. Um, I need to mention, though, this, is, this will affect how we do things here. And I, I mentioned that uh, FDA regulates 80% of the U.S. food supply. USDA does uh, the other 20%, by the way. And they have two fundamentally different approaches to listeria control. Now, listeria is a real problem with meat, uh, with uh, especially deli meats, uh, with, with uh, some cheeses. And anyway, the, uh, and so USDA uses a seek and destroy approach to uh, uh, controlling listeria. Basically, what it means is they go and they test the hell out of a plant, looking for it, hoping they find it. And when they do, they zero in and they kill it. Now, with, uh, uh, under FDA regulations, you know, it's, uh, we don't have anything like that. If, if we have a positive uh, for listeria on a food contact surface or on the product, then we've got an issue that and possibly uh, even be in a recall situation. Now, there's, there's a group of, of uh, experts in the industry that are working with FDA to see if we can either change or modify or, or bring it more into the 21st century so that we can actually be more responsible on our listeria control. In the meantime, it's not that way yet. We have to be careful on how we control listeria. Um, if you contact Chris afterwards, I, uh, uh, there is a listeria guide that's been published, listeria control guide that's been published specifically for the fresh produce industry. And uh, I'll, be I'll be glad to share that with Chris so that he can, he can uh, um, 
uh, make sure that anybody who wants a copy can have it. And, and it gives you pretty much the basics. Uh, uh, and, and, and it was written by a group, you know, a group of experts, not just in Listeria, but in, in fresh produce. We have to be careful. I, uh, I mentioned earlier about the approach that, uh, about things that we can do to control Listeria in a produce plant. Here, I'm going to close this down a little. And this is, this is something that we do separately from what we do in our, on our basic plant sanitation. There's not a lot we can do out in the field other than basic uh, sanitation. In other words, we don't pick up fruit from the ground. I mentioned earlier that Listeria is a soil-borne organism. It's not the only place it lives, but it lives there all, all uh, uh, it can be found there. I mean, I'm a professional and I bet I have Listeria at my house. So, so you can count on it being, you know, being in the ground. So if you have, if you have, if you have a, a drop fruit, just leave it there. Now in the plant, on the other hand, this is where it gets dicey because one berry can come in, contaminate a surface and every berry that, that touches that same surface will pick some up and you cannot disinfect. Even if we could wash berries and, and, and they would survive, you can't disinfect a contaminated piece of fruit. So what we, what we want to do is um, keep listeria from growing in our facilities. And we use a different set of chemistries to attack listeria. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, parasitic acid, or one of, one of the many parasitic acids. You can buy sanitizers, but that's the active ingredient. If you look at the listeria guide, a uh, uh, guide that uh, uh, will be available to you, it'll, it'll give you uh, uh, more more detail about that and how how to deal with growth niches and and uh, 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 specific problems that listeria uh, poses that we don't normally have to uh, uh, consider when, when, when we're looking at regular plant sanitation, which generally addresses uh, salmonella and E. coli and, and other more commonly found, uh, or I shouldn't say commonly found, but other organisms that generally have been associated with fresh produce. Questions on listeria? This would be a good time to bring them up. So <clears throat> earlier, I think you said to Daryl that um, he'd be surprised if there was, you'd be surprised if there was anyone who hadn't uh, come in contact with listeria, or hadn't eaten salad, listeria on a piece of salad. But then you're, you contradicted that kind of when you said one in five people that get or that have listeria die. So, I mean, you <laughs> good question. No, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, listeria is all over the place, but, uh, um, the mortality rate for listeriosis, people that actually have gotten sick from listeria, is greater than one in five. And uh, um, fortunately, as nasty as this bug is, the infective dose is relatively high. There's no exact number. It depends, it depends on, on, the, uh, uh, on that particular strain of listeria monocytogenes. That, uh, um, but I've heard numbers that go anywhere from 10,000 organisms to... Uh, um, over 10 billion. That number actually came from CDC at one time. And so you, ha you have to, uh, people generally have to ingest a lot of listeria, you know, uh, before an illness occur. There's no guarantee to that. The, uh, uh, Dr. Zhu uh, had uh, the Bluebell uh, uh, ice cream incident up on, on one of the slides. And there were some disturbing numbers there that it looks like some people may have gotten a, uh, uh, listeriosis from much fewer numbers. The jury's still out there. I don't know all the details on that. But uh, generally, uh, um, generally, it takes quite a, bit of, quite a bit of listeria contamination to cause disease, which is why we can't afford to let it pile up in our facilities. Now, when we, uh, when we sanitize a facility and then, and then it gets cold in the facility, or it's, if, it's a cool, if it's a cooler, you know, growth really, really slows down tremendously for, for uh, 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 E. coli, salmonella. But listeria tends to do pretty well when it gets cold. We already know that freezing won't kill it, but I'm talking about cold temperatures. So other organisms aren't growing, but listeria still is. 
So we, we, like I said, we treat it separately and it's, and it's, it's not rocket science. You know, we, we, uh, places that listeria loves cold, wet places because it, it can thrive there where other bacteria don't. So drains are perfect examples. So we, uh, uh, at our company, you know, we, uh, we treat our drains with quaternary ammonia, except for our organic, our organic plants, because not only does it kill listeria, but it leaves a residue. It's a gift that keeps on giving. For our lines, we use uh, um, peroxyacetic acid or one of the other pear acids because not only is it really good at killing listeria, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it's really good in attacking biofilms, like I, like I was mentioning. Was everyone in here when I mentioned, uh, anyone not know what a biofilm is? I think I mentioned it earlier. And then uh, um, this, is, it, it this is proven to be a pretty effective uh, approach even with the, uh, um, the difficult regulatory environment that we're in. So while I can't say that I'm not worried about listeria or anyone getting sick with listeria from our products, we have to be. But from a practical standpoint, the regulatory issues of listeria are, are, are maybe greater than the public health issues, you know, be, because we're testing an awful lot for it right now. And we have to be careful in the types of tests that we do. Uh, in the summer of 2014, one of California's major uh, tree fruit growers, uh, peaches, plums, nectarines, uh, they wanted to do the right thing, but they did it poorly. They ended up testing for listeria on, on a, one, a packing line that they were currently producing product on, and they ended up with a positive for listeria monocytogenes. By the way, um, listeria monocytogenes is the only listeria that's a pathogen. But... So, so uh, uh, what we do is we test for listeria species, you know, for our environmental testing. But if you come up with a positive for listeria species on a zone one on a food contact surface, FDA will consider that as if it were listeria monocytogenes. And, and that's, what, that's what happened to the, uh, to the California fruit packer. And they, end up ha they ended up having to, I don't know how many packages they had to bring in, but it was millions of dollars worth of uh, product that they had to recall. So... I'm not saying don't test. To the contrary, we test. Just before you jump into the testing game, make sure that you reach out to an extension agent or at least somebody who knows to make sure that you're doing it properly and in a way that won't put your own, uh, your own company or farm in jeopardy, in regulatory jeopardy. But you do want to use every tool at your disposal to fight these organisms, uh, not only because it's the law, but because it's the right thing to do. You know, on top of that, you know, here's another thing too. I've been doing this for a long time, and you know, my father was in the industry, and and but you know, he, he uh, uh, not as a scientist, but but still, I'm looking at the difference between what we do now and what they did in my father's day, and you know, there isn't a grower or a company in the industry that is, does has not had to contend with quality claims. Anybody in here not? ever have a quality claim <laughs> and so you get a federal inspection you get mold you get uh, you get you get product that's dumped basically you don't get money for your product well for every one of these pathogens we're talking about killing with our food safety programs we're probably killing gazillions of spoilage organisms this is making you better companies this increases your chance of making money this increases your chance of the next generation uh, uh, continuing your business. So it's more than just what we have to do for FISMA. You know, FISMA is the result of us understanding or recognizing that there were outbreaks being caused by fresh produce. A lot of companies adopted uh, 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 gaps and, and, and other food safety programs early on, but not everybody was. And as in, we import a lot of produce. Our company imports a lot of produce, but we don't do it because they're cheap widgets from China. We do it for seasonal purposes, and that's going to keep happening. Now, under the uh, uh, World Trade Organization, we can't require anything from another country that we don't require from ourselves. You know, they, the WTO would have us in court and we would lose. So these same rules apply not just for Washington state produce, but the other 49 states and any other country that's producing product for, uh, that's gonna be consumed in the US. Now also, uh, 
while this is not part of, this won't affect you directly, the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, that's another, um, another one of the FISMA rules, now puts the onus of responsibility for food safety on the importer. Granted, the, uh, if there's a problem, uh, uh, the producer will still be looked at heavily by, by FDA, but, uh, but that puts more um, responsibility on the importer for what they're importing. So the idea is to serve public health. And so uh, if um, uh, some of these items like the water quality issues and all that, uh, 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 it's because it, it cover, it, it's meant to cover the entire globe, not just Washington State. I'm going to move on a little. Now, um, questions, 